Hey everybody, this is Brian Ayello, and um, this episode is number nine of Origins, Stories on Creativity. Uh, I'm talking to Hunter Motts in this installment. Uh, not sure if I'm overusing the word fantastic, but you know, I really enjoy enjoy all of my conversations, especially with with, with Mr. Motts. Um, his history is really interesting. Um, I don't know if you can believe everything you see on the internet, but you know, he went to Harvard, went to school at the Princes in England, um, hails from Dutch aristocracy, was a reality TV star at one point. Um, I discovered him on the Joe Rogan podcast. Uh, they had a four hour discussion. Uh, they discussed education, anthropology, archaeology. Uh, Mr. Mons has an extensive vocabulary. It seems like he memorizes instantly anything he reads. Uh, we had a two-hour conversation. Thoroughly enjoyed everything that we talked about. Um, and I hope you do also. Uh, here's Hunter Mons. excited to uh, talk with you, sir. How are you doing? Well, uh, firstly, I'm definitely not a sir. Um, <laughs> really so like a sir, and Her Majesty has yet to recognize me uh, oh, no way. As, having, as having done extraordinary things for the British Empire. <laughs> so no, no, no sir here. Now, here's my question, Brian. Sure. How do you, firstly, congratulations on spelling your first name it's, it's honestly the only thing I can spell Alan. correctly. <laughs> Google documents can tell you that right now. I cannot spell anything right. <laughs> well, and we do live in the age of spell check. And then how do you pronounce, is your last name A-L-O? A-L-O, that's right. Okay. And where is that from? It's uh, Napoledon. It's Naples. Wow. Wow. So some, yeah, that's, that's intense. Um, so yeah, so how, how can I be useful to you? What do you want to talk about? Well, I, I, I guess I want to talk about your career as an educator. Uh, are you still teaching? So yeah, so I, uh, after college, um, I started tutoring just to pay my bills and had this experience of, um, you know, hearing all these kids say things like, oh, I didn't get the math gene or, oh, I don't have a natural ear for languages or you know, uh, I'm just not a natural writer. And I was like, these are very specific biological claims that you're making here, right? Like you're claiming there is a math gene that you don't have it. And I was like, what is this? Where do, where do these ideas come from? And so, uh, you know, my response, because it was, you know, we sort of like, it took a long time to untease this, but it was very clear that these kids really believe these things and they were really affecting the choices that they were making in school and that, you know, essentially they weren't trying because they thought they were genetically doomed to fail. And so began an odyssey across the uh, scientific literature and was just like, oh, there's a whole bunch of science here that could really help a lot of kids um, and no one is telling them about it. So we decided, and I say we, uh, Katie O'Brien and I, who were both tutoring and running this tutoring company. But she's a, she's a, a colleague of yours from Harvard, right? We, we went to the, as Richard Nixon called it, the Kremlin on the Charles, uh, <laughs> together. Um, and, uh, so, you know, we started, we started figuring out, okay, how do we package this together? And, you know, usually you would write these books and you would write them to, you know, parents for some sort of mass discussion about education. And we were like, okay, that's great. But then you're just giving the parent the problem of then having to convince the kids and getting kids to listen to parents. And in general, teenagers don't. So we decided to write the book direct to the disgruntled teenager and give them the practical advice they needed to have get better results in school and have a much better experience in school, crucially. You know what um, I so found interesting is you, I think you mentioned this in one of your last podcasts, is that prisoners were oh, accepting yeah. your, that was, accepting your that was knowledge a, more than uh, kids were. Well, I don't know about more than kids, but certainly, I mean, the the it's ama it's been amazing, you know, the degree to which there's an adult obvi audience, because obviously, you know, um, so we had this, uh, we got contacted by this guy in Oklahoma um, who ran a charity and he would just sort of give away 
books to uh, prisoners. And he read our book and he instantly got it and was like, I want to print up a lot of copies for your books and give them to prisoners. And so we were like, okay. And so he did. <laughs> and, um, you know, we've get, we, get these, we get these letters from these prisoners who are like, man, I would not be in here if I'd read this in high school. If I'd had Seriously. This in high school, I wish I'd had this. So, yeah. What do you think in your book actually speaks to somebody with that type of background? Uh, what do you think would have prevented uh, them from becoming criminals? I think it's the fact that, listen, you know, uh, there's a great Philip Larkin poem mm -hmm. uh, that I love uh, called This Be the Verse. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, if I could swear on this podcast, can I swear on this podcast? You can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. The so, great Hunter Motz can do whatever he wants. Well, I don't know about, yeah, he's again with the greatness. I don't like that. Um, so, so, no, there's a great, uh, it's this great line. Your mom and dad, they fuck you up. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. And what Larkin is talking about is that process of picking things up from your environment. And we pick up these beliefs about ourselves. We pick up these ideas about ourselves. And, you know, the reality is, is that prisoners were fucked up by their environment, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they, they picked up some concept of what they could or could not do. We had this amazing Brian, uh, the other Brian, my now Alan. second favorite Brian, <laughs> Brian Kelly. Favorite Brian, Brian Kelly, yeah. um, But we had this amazing interview with Freeway Rick Ross. Uh -huh, I know that guy. Yeah, uh, not the rapper, but the, the, original, uh, the guy. Yeah. Yeah, the guy who popularized crack cocaine. Um, and he was just, you know, I mean, Freeway was clearly a very smart guy. But he literally couldn't, I think he was read and write. And so even though he got a tel ton of scholarship and would have gone off to college, um, you know, he ended up, that wasn't a path he could pursue. And so his intelligence and his resourcefulness gets devoted to developing and popularizing crack cocaine. So human intelligence is a given. Like humans are resourceful. They find ways to survive. But the point is, is that when you don't think that you have what it takes to succeed within the system, you try and find ways to succeed outside the system. And so, you know, if you're, uh, if you're a young kid and you, I get this idea that you will never be good at math or writing or reading or school or any of that sort of academic stuff, then where do you end up devoting your energies? Well, very often you'll end up devoting your energies to crime. But the real point is, is that you got the wrong concept about your brain and you got this idea of your own potential it wasn't grounded in uh, the biology. Um, and it was just, you know, you being fucked up by your culture and getting the yeah. wrong messages. You know, what's interesting about that is I, I believe you started out your academic career in biochemistry, correct? Uh -huh. You started out with, uh, I guess, I mean, you worked with James Watson a little bit, and he was one of the originators of the genetic, uh, the DNA, what is it, the model? He won the Nobel yeah, Prize. Yeah, the double helix. And uh, his ideas, I mean, looking at what he was explaining, he has a theory that you could basically eradicate a lot of stupid people by, you know, <laughs> shopping, uh, or what, what, why don't you explain it, since you're the more articulate of us. Well, no, it's just, okay, so I think part of the, so, so much of this comes down to stereotypes, right? Yeah. So people have stereotypes, you know, uh, like, you know, we've, we've all got a racist uncle probably, <laughs> right? <laughs> probably. And, probably, and at least white people do. And then, you know, it's like your racist uncle has never actually met anybody who doesn't fit that stereotype uh, or who who, you know, is black or who is, you know, from wherever and you know in the same way it's like you know a lot of people who hate gay people have never met a gay person well part of it is is that most people have never met a scientist and certainly not a famous scientist mm -hmm. and so they seem pretty fucking mysterious right it's yeah. generally a it's the, half the stereotype is sort of positive like all oh, these people are so smart they're such geniuses they're all this sort of stuff and then the other half of it is they're a little bit weird, not grounded in reality, you know, don't know how to talk to people. I mean, there's and, some conspiracy uh, with James Watson, too. So he said some. Well, the, yeah, the, the key thing things. about Jim is that you got to understand Jim's personality. And, you know, Jim's strength and his weakness was always that he uh, had a real eye for the sensational and a real lust for the sensational. 
And so that's why he understood when you read, and this is actually, it's a great book. It's one of the best books on how science actually works um, in terms of all the soap opera drama. Um, there's a book called The Double Helix written by James Watson, all about the discovery. And you'll see all the twists and turns. You'll see all the interpersonal dynamics and all of the drama. And you'll get a sense of, a sense of at least who Jim was. But so mm -hmm. Jim understood very clearly that uh, the double helix was where it was at. Essentially, whoever figured out the structure of the life molecule and they thought it was DNA was going to be able to dine out on this forever because they were going to sort of define the epoch. It was going to be the quintessential discovery, right? And yeah. so lots of stuff has happened, you know, in terms of moving forward genetics, lots and lots of things have happened. Most of the people who have moved the thing forward don't really know, you know, like if I, if I was to ask you, you know, who did, uh, who figured out transcription? Would you be able to tell me? No. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I, who was it, who was it that figured out, you know, uh, restriction enzymes. Would you be able to tell me? No. Probably not, right? So what ends up happening is there's a whole body of work and then it all sort of gets concentrated. You know, could you tell me, oh, you know, Jim's work was based on uh, Chargaff's data or, you know, uh, Rosalind Franklin's X-ray crystallographs? No. What happens is, is that there's this process of creating genius myths where the work of many people is concentrated in a single individual. And so, you know, Jim has become essentially like a modern uh, god, right? Like he's an icon. Um, but that's because, you know, it's sort of like this great achievement that, that was the crowning achievement of this double helix is, you know, it's, it's that he put the final pieces together, but like you can't do that without all the pieces beforehand. What I find interesting is he said that you could remove the genes that make us animals and basically perfect us correct i mean remove stupidity from the human race make us one way or another by influencing the genes you're saying the genes don't matter and that you could actually teach the brain to do what you want the brain to do well correct? It, yeah so the, the brain is incredibly flexible it's neuroplastic um that's actually our superpower and, you know, what you run up against here are intuitions of authority. Jim has a Nobel Prize. I have a bachelor's mm -hmm. degree. So the question, who knows? <laughs> but from Harvard, well, though. From Harvard? <laughs> yeah. Does, doesn't that make you a god? I don't know. I can't. Well, there's like, there's, you know, it is this weird sort of trump card of authority. And the problem is, is that, you know, we should ultimately be citing the science based on the data. But then most people don't actually look at the data. So it becomes about that. But I could take you through what the data actually supports. So the big thing is there's this, uh, there's this whole body of work now on cultural evolution. And these are things you can track. So I talked mm -hmm. about people being fucked up by their environment. What is the process by which that happens, Brian? How do you pick up culture from your environment? Parents. Well, it, by the way, yeah, you're parents raised. And, cru and crucially, how you feel about those people. Yeah. So cru it's, it comes down to the emotion of awe. I wonder right? though, is it, is it like the fight or flight mechanism? Are you running away from something that you don't know or are you going to it? Well, Cause it sounds like you are a type of person well, that would be accepting of something you don't know and trying to embrace it and explore it and become more familiar with it as where maybe a prisoner would be more willing to run from the map instead of embracing well, what he doesn't know. Well, fight or flight fear is huge, right? And so, yeah. you know, we have many, many emotions, right? There's fear, shame, disgust, Not anger, shame, yeah. uh, you know, curiosity. There's a whole range of different emotions. There's learned helplessness, which is one people don't really talk about. You know, reflection is a very particular cognitive state. Um, and then there's lots of mindsets. So we have all these different things. And, you know, we switch between all of them during a given day, right? Mm -hmm. So there are moments of joy, moments of sadness, there are moments of disgust, mm -hmm. there are moments of curiosity, there are moments of shame, and all of these things motivate very different behaviors. And the crucial thing is what is the appropriate and inappropriate emotion? So none of these emotions is good or bad. They all have functions. But to take, for example, if we're going to talk educationally, yeah, fear is a great one to look at. So... 
you know, fear causes very specific things, right? So it's, uh, I was listening to Rogan with uh, Peterson yesterday, Jordan Peterson, and, you know, Rogan makes the distinction, which is an important distinction that, you know, there's uh, fight, flight, or freeze, right? So those are the three sort of big behaviors that happen in a state of uh, fear. Um, now, the, the key thing is, is that part of what happens in a state of fear is, is that your attention shuts down. You literally, I was so scared I couldn't think, mm -hmm. right? So you can't think in a state of fear. So, you know, is fear a bad emotion? No, there's a great book called The Gift of Fear, all about how fear will get you to run away from dangerous things and often save your life. Oh, yeah, definitely. There's, but, a, there's a whole philosophy around fear being a survival mechanism. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. It's how you yeah. use that fear yeah. to either, you know, make yourself a better person or you can succumb to it and become a worse person. Well, it's also crucially what you're afraid of and whether your fear is appropriate. It's all so death, isn't it? Is, it's all based on dying. Well, there's certainly, I mean, I don't know about you, Brian, <laughs> but I have a pretty strong fear and healthy fear of Yeah, dying. I think that's basically um, what we are all afraid of on the very bottom of the fear spectrum. That's where it boils down to the end of it, right? Yep. Well, that's, I mean, that's the ultimate fear. Uh -huh. um, but the, the, you know, the if, in the context of something like math, right, you know, fear is the worst response you can have, right? Because... Mm -hmm. The fear shuts down your attention, and then you're not in a position to think. It makes you think, right? I'm so stupid. I can't do this. Right. And I don't want to be stupid, because if I'm stupid, it means this whole host of other things. So experience, this sounds like, Brian, I'm, I think I'm getting a sense that maybe these are personal experiences that you have. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> so so let's, let's open up that sure. can of arms, Brian. Yeah, let's do it. I'll tell, I'll me, tell you, um, when I was in school, I was in remedial math all the way through. I was not given an opportunity really to, to study calculus or to study geometry even. And it, that was the end of the road as far as my high school education goes. And high school was not very profitable for me mm -hmm. in terms of that type of education. And it's unfortunate because now as an adult, I'm incredibly interested, but I don't have the basis. I don't have the, the foundation. In college, I was able to do it. In high school, I wasn't given an opportunity. I think that's disappointing. Well, I mean, you know, and that's the thing. It's, you know, the, the question is, I mean, listen, we, we all grow up in fucked up or less than ideal environments to some extent. And what I mean by that is, is like, obviously, you know, some people have it much worse. Some people have it much better. But, you know, part of it is that, you know, just the nature of progress and time moving forward. Like I had this conversation with Brian Callen and, mm -hmm. you know, he was talking about how at 50, I'm just learning how to learn. I remember that conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And the point is that, you know, on the one hand, Brian could, you know, he can definitely say, I wish I knew this, but it wouldn't be realistic to think that he could have known this. Because a lot of this science just hadn't been put together. It wasn't available. It wasn't, we didn't have that clarity. There were these old ideas and there was a prevailing wisdom. And, you know, for example, you know, Brian talked in our interview with Carol Dweck about, you know, sort of the age of IQ and his IQ being tested and him sort of really reaching this conclusion that like, oh, he just wasn't like a, one of the smart kids. And so he was going <laughs> to focus his energies in totally different places. And that was how we used to think about intelligence. You know, it, that's, that's the old model. And then, you know, more information comes along and we come to realize that we've, we've misinterpreted that data. And the key thing that we've misinterpreted is this, is, is that IQ has been going up consistently throughout history, um, which is not the sort of thing that most people know or understand. But well, you know what's called... interesting about intelligence, and especially about Brian Callen, who surprised me when I listened to mixed uh, mental arts for the first time. You know, I'm familiar with him from the Joe Rogan experience, and he doesn't come off as <laughs> the same way he does on your guys' podcast. Yeah. He's a very intelligent man, says some incredibly interesting things. But in terms of intelligence, I'm not going to say he's a genius mathematician, but he doesn't have to be. He has his own special intelligence, and it comes off. 
I did well, not learn math and I didn't learn math in high school or college in the same way that maybe you did or my wife. I learned, you know, how to be more creative, how to <laughs> how to draw a figure, how to tell a story, how to make something out of clay. My intelligence was enhanced in different ways. I don't have the skills to use that math, but I have the skills to write a novel. You know, you know what I mean? Brian Callen has the skills to stand on a sca- uh, stage or be on a podcast and entertain the living shit out of people. Well, and I mean, I think this, what's worth clarifying is what is intelligence? Yeah. Right? I mean, that's a really sort of basic question. And, you know, what you're pushing up against there is, is that there's this sort of idea that intelligence is limited to doing well in school. Exactly. And that, that's not necessarily the case. We know lots and lots of people. So you, one of the things that I always enjoy hearing is the book smart versus street smart thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Which is yeah, all have bullshit too, in a way. <laughs> well, it's there, there, you're, so in general, I, I find, you know, you'll often hear, uh, you know, academics say, we don't even really know what intelligence is. You can't define it. And I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard because <laughs> The Romans, like the very word intelligence comes from the root interlegere. So it means to choose between. And it's a wisdom to know the difference. And that's what intelligence is. So Can you add success you know, to that in some way or another? Well, the result of that is success. Exactly. Right? Like that, that's, I mean, you know, so for example, here's, a, you know, things that I, I always think, uh, so, you know, uh, Katie often gives the example, compares herself to her dad, right? Who, you know, Katie went to Harvard, you know, she studied humanities, you know, reading, writing, all that stuff. But then her dad, you know, grew up in the woods of Maine, never had a real formal education or much of one. I mean, he had one, but, it, you know, school was never for him. And, um, or at least he thought that. And then he... Um, you know, but the guy can like take apart and fix literally anything. Can, so, can you say what he did for a living? Oh yeah, he was like, um, I think he was was he? Uh, I think he worked for the gas company, or maybe it was the electricity company. I can't remember. But yeah, but you know, this is a guy who you know, in essence, you know, he's an engineer. Like that's what he is, right? Yeah. Like he fixes shit. That's what engineers do. But he has a concept of himself and a concept of his own intelligence where he doesn't think of himself as necessarily being smart. But the point <laughs> is, is that, you know, you put me in that environment or Katie in that environment, and we are utterly fucking lost. We have no idea what yeah. to do. And it really, it's this ability to diagnose, right? So a lot of what intelligence really is about is diagnosis. So my, um, my grandfather had this great thing where, you know, a, all my dad's family were doctors. And, you know, after centuries and centuries of being doctors, they come down to these two principles that are one, if in doubt, leave it alone. The body is generally much better at fixing itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and then two, the, the, the really great doctors are not the ones who can administer drugs or, you know, give a, an injection or a lance of oil. It's the ones who can diagnose who can look at that mess of symptoms and figure out what the core issue is. And so if you think about Katie's dad, he is a master uh, diagnostician, right? Cause he can, he can like, you could be there, a car's not running. He can listen and he can quickly interpret what that sound is. He could take a dumb say, system ah. and use his intelligence to That's right. make it work for him. That's right. Or my uncle Bill, who works uh, for for the at the Ford plant as an electrician in Blue Springs, Missouri. Uh, <laughs> you know, th- same thing. Like we have, he and I have very different types of intelligence. So I'm very good at parsing out. You know, oh, why is a student not getting this? What's going on? What's off academically? Uncle Bill, you know, is very good at doing that with anything. You know, electronic oh, this thing isn't working. And then he knows how to go in there and tinker around and figure out how to get it to work. Um, and so, you know, it sounds like you're saying the same thing in terms of you and writing and storytelling that you're like, oh, this isn't working. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. The, you know, it's not, it's not really clear what you're saying here. Let's re-clarify that. Oh, this paragraph should go here. 
Let's do it. And Let's I don't think that the education system allows for that too much anymore. I mean, the straight A conspiracy, unfortunately, you know, I'm lazy and I did not read your book. But <laughs> <laughs> it, is and available, I will, uh, it is available as audiobook. So it is. Oh, okay, I could listen to it. <laughs> but I mean, could you explain to me exactly in every minute detail possible what your book is about? Yeah, no, I'm so, joking. No, please, please do. I'm know, joking. But, no, but I'll give you. I'll give you absolutely. Yeah. Like I don't. For you know, you have to understand why. Do, and a lot of this comes down to why do people write books? Some yeah. people write books is, you know, they're trying to make money or they're trying to, uh, you know, sort of build the the build themselves up as some sort of guru and authority and all of that. I don't and get like, that. What's what you're doing? No, I, I think no. there's more going on here. Yeah, there is more going on. I mean, we'd like to make money. You know, uh, Katie's dog, Beasley, is very, uh, you know, she has a lot of demands. But um, but, the, but the point is that, you know, but the, the, the main thing is, is that, you know, there's, there's, you know, a lot of people try and create mystery around themselves. And they mm -hmm. try and be, want you to think that they're so smart. And, you know, really great teachers demystify, right? They remove the mystery and they're constantly trying to give away their knowledge and break things down and make it simpler. And so that was the real point of the straight A conspiracy. So if, you know, the book got pirated and everybody read it and community was like, oh, I get it. That's great. Now we can do better. I would be on a personal financial level, maybe a little bit sad, but uh, ultimately, you know, my work would be done. Yeah. Um, so, so very simply, the straight A conspiracy is the idea that some people are born smart, mm -hmm. um, and that you know uh, some people can't get A's, or that some people don't have what it takes to get A's. And but, by being smart, you mean really good at memorizing, regurgitating well, information for I mean, tests. Well, but I mean also that there's some sort of genetic superpower that some people have that sets them up for academic success. And that some people don't have those genes or just don't have what it takes. But according and, to Watson, though, there are no genes for smart people. There's only genes for, like, select – I don't know. I don't even want to use the word, but I guess scientifically you can retardation. Yeah. So, I mean, the – the you know, if we're going to – I mean, yeah. So, people – so, there, there was a thing that came out of um, – uh, nature reviews neuroscience or something like that and it was uh you know we use this figure in the straight a conspiracy that they found 300 genes for essentially mental retardation and zero genes for normal to above average intelligence but i think the more useful way to think about you know what an education is supposed to be is to think about culture right so all all you know humans across the planet absorb culture from their environment mm -hmm. And that culture enables them to survive anywhere in, in that environment. It doesn't enable them to survive anywhere. So if you have somebody in the Amazon, you know, the Yanomamo or whatever, some tribe down there, they've absorbed the culture of the Yanomamo. And they've got a whole oh. bunch of ways of thinking that enable them to survive in the Amazon. Now, Put them in New York I've, City, they're going to be a little bit screwed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, <laughs> And, and you can see those cultural differences. I think New York City is a great example, right? Because what happens if even we take somebody from um, – so here, here's a fun one. <laughs> so, so my mother's from Kansas City, and there's a town near Kansas City called Manhattan, Kansas. Yeah, um, yeah there's a port right there. Right, port, right, right yeah. away, I believe. Yeah, and it's – Manhattan, Kansas is a tiny little farming town. There's not much going on there. They call it the Little Apple. So what happens if you take somebody from the little apple and put them in the big apple? How well do they do? Um, really all depends because the little apple is a military um, off post. I mean, that's dangerous there. Well, but there's <laughs> you, a you're dealing with soldiers all day long. So I, I don't, it's a difficult question to answer because you've got your, your, your street smarts there too. Right? But I mean, it's, it's not like you're a quizzical small town. Okay, fine. It was. I like the Manhattan, the Manhattan thing. You can no, do something else. I'm sorry to mess it up for you, but I'm, I'm military. No, so. no, no. <laughs> like, I was stationed at Fort Campbell, yeah, Kentucky, yeah. and that's, like, near Clarksville. And if you step foot off post, it's like you had to yeah, yeah, deal yeah. with these small this, the, these people that were looking to take your money any way they could. Yeah. So, okay. There you go. Wait a minute. 
Well, I don't know that the people in Manhattan, Kansas are like that. Maybe they are. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't, I wasn't stationed there, but I assume they were. I don't know. Well, let's go, let's go with Smallville, Kansas, there you go. Mi- Superman's <laughs> mythical home. But, you know, you take somebody from Smallville, Kansas, and you put them in, uh, you know, look at Superman. I mean, Superman, clearly powerful, yeah. brilliant, whatever, right? But you put him in, suddenly you put him in me- Metropolis, and he's like a little bit lost. It's like yeah. uh, you or me being plopped into the Amazon. And so he's picked up a whole series of tools that enable him to survive in the environment of Smallville. But, you know, suddenly he's in this new environment and his culture doesn't particularly work. So the point of education is supposed to be to provide you with tools that enable you to survive in the environment of the working world. Yep. Right. Now, the problem is, is that the, you know, the educational system that we have today was designed for the industrial age. And so, you know, the whole thing is, uh, you know, read and write and arithmetic, right? The three R's, which already is so disturbing because yeah. it's not three R's. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that's the idea is, oh, you're going to have these core skills and then you're going to use them and it's going to enable you to do a factory job. The problem is, is that because technology is changing so quickly, what that means is, is that any set of skills you learn today are not going to be the skills you need in 10, 20 years. I don't even know what education is for today, honestly. I mean, you, I, I know you're getting to that point where there are no factory jobs in this country, but I was reading an article about a teacher who was basically lamenting the fact that everything that she teaches every day is geared to this test, that if she doesn't have enough teacher, or not teacher, students passing it, she loses her job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's an insane system. It's an insane it's system, an insane exactly. System. It's horrible. And it's not setting, it's, it's designed to fill quotas. And it's not, it's not designed. designed to push kids out into a world where they're going to get a job and buy property and push kids out. It's designed to push kids almost into prison, it seems. Well, it's designed it's, to make this. I think it's, you know, I, I uh, in general, like I know we called our book The Straight A Conspiracy, but I tend not to run with actual conspiracies. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the reason why is just because, you know, I mean, uh, having gone to places like Harvard, um, and, you know, having traveled around and done all that stuff and, you know, tutoring rich people's children for a long time, you know, mm-hmm. you, you get a certain expo- <laughs> exposure to, <laughs> you know, the people who are supposed to be Bilderberging it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in practice, I mean, that's what I always find hilarious about the Alex Joneses of the world is that they're like, the government is full of incompetent idiots, but they're also <laughs> geniuses who mastermind these massive conspiracies. Which one is, is it? it? Come on, Alex. Are they, are they geniuses or are it they can't idiots? Be both. They can't be both. Or are they just pretending to be idiots so that you don't see their genius? Oh, like man, I wish. I really do. Fuck up the post office and the DMV so that we don't catch on to how brilliant they really are. Uh, <laughs> Let's just do a bad job. They'll never know. <laughs> yeah, I, I in general, so I, I like to go with, uh, you know, Hanlon's razor, right? Never trim Yeah, you said that out. before. Can you actually do me a favor? Can you go into what Hanlon's razor is for lazy yeah. people like me so, who never actually Google it when you mention it? This is the whole point is, is that I want to I want to empower people with ideas and I want to facilitate and enable your laziness, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> I so much appreciate that. So Occam's razor. So what Occam's razor is, is this little rule of thumb. It's this quick thing that you can use to, you know, sort of essentially use have intelligence, right? How to choose between. So Occam's razor is all things being equal. The simplest explanation is the truth. Mm-hmm. So. If there's, you know, we've got these, the sort of the Alex Jones set up where it's like, they're both, they're pretend, let's imagine that Alex said, oh, they're pretending to be incompetent idiots uh, so that you don't really realize that their genius plan is to control your life. Okay, so that's one, that's version A. And then there's version B, which is that they're just idiots. <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and, you know, version B, which one is simpler? Well, version B is that they're just idiots, right? It's like yeah. less complex. It's all that. And so Occam said, all things being equal, version B is the, the simpler one is the truth. Hanlon's razor just sort of builds really on that and just says, you know, never attribute to malice what can be explained by stupidity. 
So hey, that my wife know, says the exact same thing. Honestly, it's so much. It's too much effort to be mean. Most people just try, yeah, to, oh, get yeah. try to get by. Yeah, and most <laughs> people just aren't really thinking about it. It's not even that they're stupid. It's just that they're oblivious. Yeah, they're just they right? don't care about you. All they care about is themselves. They're just trying to make it happen. That's right. That's right. And you know, it's like you know, why do humans litter? Right? Like it's like, well, it doesn't matter. There are no trash cans. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that what they say? There's no trash cans anywhere nearby, so they litter. You put a trash yeah. can, they're more apt to use it. And 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 exactly. And so you have to facilitate people the laziest and easiest choice being the most productive and helpful one. Um, but the but the point is that you know I don't really buy into conspiracies per se because they require a level of sort of malice and sort of master planning uh, that is, you know, I just I, is not my experience of humans um, and doesn't really fit what we know from the biology. Um, mostly it is just, you know, people just have not thought this through. And even, you know, think about someone like, you know, Freeway Rick Ross, right? You'd say like, oh, here's a guy, he dealt crack cocaine, right? You know, he sh I'm presuming he, killed people i don't remember but you know uh the point is, is that i don't think he went dealer. to prison for that though i'm not quite i can't remember either i think he he went to prison for dealing but i don't know if he killed th anybody and i don't remember you know, that being again, part of his story like, i don't think he got out of prison for murdering people <laughs> normally yeah. no no i think he, he yeah so but even and you know again even if you did kill people you're probably not going to go around and tell people you killed people yeah exactly you're um, not going to brag yeah. So um, the the point is, is that, you know, but a guy like that, right, you know, you could say, oh, Rick Freeway, Rick Ross is a bad dude. But then you talk to him and you're like, this is just really the issue was that he was oblivious to his own potential. And he was oblivious to the fact that the same skills that enabled him to succeed as a drug dealer were the same skills that would have allowed him to succeed in business. And he understands that now. But he certainly did not understand that when he was whatever sixteen. Um, do you do you, so, is he succeeding in business now though, or is he still taking advantage of what he was doing at sixteen? Well, he's you know he's written a book and now he's trying to. Uh, he had I mean when we saw him, we haven't seen him in years, but when we saw him, you know he had a uh, he had a musician that he was promoting, so I think he's trying to get into the music, music. business. Um, so. You know, uh, but but the the um, you know that's the core of the strain of conspiracy is that you've picked up a whole sort of bunch of myths about intelligence, myths about potential, and you know that really it's the issue is not that you know you don't have the kind of brain it takes to succeed; it's that you haven't been doing it using the brain in the right way. And so you know you talked about. I was going to ask, how would you recommend? I mean, I have children. I have two rambunctious two-year-olds how would you recommend that i facilitate them using their brain in the right way the number one thing is you have to teach them to embrace mistakes um so crucially you know you said you talked about feeling stupid and stupid is a feeling and it's the feeling of shame so you can look at a mistake and you can be like oh man i'm an idiot gene or oh i don't have what it takes to succeed and you can essentially feel ashamed about it. And if you look, every mo emotion motivates certain behaviors. So when you feel shame about things, you hide them, you wad them up, you throw them away. And you look at what students do with bad tests and they will bury them in the bottom of their backpack. Uh, they will try and hide them. They don't wanna deal with them. And the problem is, is that getting better at things is about analyzing what's not working, analyzing your mistakes, and then using them to improve. So if you look at, for example, what happens with the FAA, when a plane crashes, uh, they get out the wreckage and they analyze the wreckage and they listen to the black box flight recorder and they try and figure out why this problem happened so that it never has to happen again. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So the point is, you're, you should you should approach everything the way that the FAA does. So, you know, it's very often what happens is that parents' own anxieties come in where they're like, oh my God, you gotta see, I'm failing as a parent. You're gonna, ah! <laughs> right? And in practice, you know, that's not particularly helpful. The question is, okay, there was a plane crash. 
Why did this plane crash happen? What can we learn from this plane crash? And how can we use this plane crash to improve our process so that we get consistently better and better and better results? And the no, more... I was wondering though, you were, I don't know, I mentioned it or you mentioned it, but um, the specific types of intelligence in terms of, uh, you know, Brian Callen and myself and you, I, th I think that, you know, definitely me and you have different types of intelligence. You're very, very good verbally. You're, you have a very good memory. You are able to regurgitate vocabulary and terms and, you know, um, this and that very well. Um, is there any use in strengthening the different types of intelligences? Like well, so you'll hear, you'll hear, so there's a guy, Howard Gardner at Harvard, and he has this thing, multiple intelligences. But like so many of these academic theories that float around, you find they actually have no scientific support. So it's a it's a tidy way of thinking. But the point is, is that is a lazy way of thinking too. Is it just a, does yeah, it allow think, somebody to go ahead? You already does know. it allow somebody to uh, just be you know an excuse making machine and say you know what ah oh, damn it that's what you're saying isn't it? Yep. <laughs> that's what you're saying. Yep. Very so good. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. And the point is, is that, you know, it's uh, what what branch of the military were you in? Army. OK, so uh, you may have had this term, but, you know, I recently heard this from a Marine. It was a great conversation, uh, too, by the way. Yep. So John Aguilar talked about embrace the suck. Yeah, I embrace the suck. <laughs> uh, is that is that is that an army phrase, too? Um, It's more of a war phrase in my in my memory, more than it is just a regular army or marine phrase. If you went to war, you embraced the suck. You got yep. stuck in and combat because so you couldn't do anything about it. And so the point is, is that the things that have the most to teach you are the ones that you least want to do, that you're least good at. Um, and so what I would encourage you to, because the real obstacles and the real hurdles there are emotional. Um, you know, you feel like it's hard. You feel like it's not for you. You feel like you'll never be good at it. And it's getting over that emotional hurdle, getting stuck in. And then crucially, everybody loves to do things that they're good at. So the problem is there's this big hump that you have to get over where you're like, oh, this thing is so shitty. I don't want to do this thing. <laughs> but then once you get good enough at it, you're like, oh, my God, I love this thing. And, you know, I mean, we joke with our students about this all the time. We're like, isn't it funny how all the things that you're good at, you like and all the things that you're not good at yet, you don't like. So what do we do about that? Why don't we make you good at everything yeah. by doing the required practice? It's very, very interesting. Um, just looking at it in terms of the teachers too, the educators themselves obviously went through some kind of schooling and you know, becoming a teacher, there are so many aspects of psychology and the whole theory behind it. And when, let's just say, for example, a math teacher becomes an educator, they're horrible. <laughs> they stand in front of the classroom and they regurgitate these, this information and they're just not connecting with anybody except for, you know, the straight A students. Well, so I, uh, Katie and I were, there's a, there's a charter school that we've been working with and we were just there and they were talking about how, you know, I was talking to the principal and he was saying, you know, we get all these te these you know young people who come out of these teachers' colleges, and they have literally learned all the wrong things. And then we have to essentially untrain them um, <laughs> to get them to do what's actually required. And you know, that's that's the thing is, is that you know, top to bottom, the system is not setting people up for success. And you know, there's there's a culture of teaching colleges, and there's a culture of schools. And you know, you as a parent have to essentially realize that the system is nuts that's okay the system is going to be nuts and it will change on some timeline but in the will meantime, it though i mean that's the problem i mean once the bog starts it just grows it never hardly shrinks well it changes when essentially you reach a critical mass and that's why i'm excited to you know talk to anybody who's excited to talk to me because the point is that you know you emotionally get this and so you're going to be an early adopter and, you know, the more people like us who get together and compare notes and, you know, are having a better way of talking about this, the more people will be pulled in. And at a certain point, when you've changed the mind of when you reach that tipping point, 
that's when the system finally changes. But, you know, so many people sit around and they just sort of bitch about what the system is. And it's like, okay, you want to change the system? You have to change a whole lot of hearts and minds. And that's what we've got to do. And we've got to go and we've got to have conversations like this. And, you know, part of it is, is that, you know, if you think about, like, just even think about, you, uh, do you have uh, sons, daughters? I have one of each. Wow. Yeah. It's won the lottery. <laughs> yeah, I won the lottery. Uh, I won the lottery. <laughs> so, so, you know, let's say that you go and, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're teaching your student, you're teaching your son and your daughter to really embrace and analyze mistakes. Well, there's going to be a couple of benefits for that. One, they'll start doing really well in school. And then two, the other thing too, is they'll have a very different emotional experience of school because there won't be all this emotional drama around, you know, how, oh, I feel stupid. Oh, I don't like this subject. Oh, all of that mishigas, right? It just becomes very clear. Oh, we're just constantly refining process and constantly refining our understanding and we're just constantly improving. And you're now, you know, your son and daughter are in their school. And then everybody's looking at that and they're like, what's the freaking deal with the ALOs, right? Like those two kids are having a very different experience. And then if your son and daughter are like, it's actually really straightforward. Let me tell you how we do this. And, you know, they explain, oh, a lot of this comes down to managing your emotions and changing how you feel about mistakes. And there's no reason why then, you know, everybody wants success. The other kids want success. The other kids don't want to be stressed. And if you demystify and reveal that process, <laughs> then lots and lots of kids will copy them. So and it's not about how, success, it's about learning, right? It's not, it, you're, we're not obsessed with what is the, what is the, you know, what is the, the final result on any one day, right? Yeah, it's about like, becoming the better human being. That's right. And if you, in the, most of, you know, what is really getting a good grade on a test about, well, it's about, did you do your learning before or after the test? So if you found all, if you've debugged your process and you found all the mistakes before the test, then you'll, you'll get a good test grade. But if Which you, the irony of that is you don't even know what kind of mistakes you're going to make until after the test is over with, correct? Well, that's not necessarily true. I mean, the point is, is that, so let's take, for example, you know, you're, you're studying for whatever it is, a history or a math test, and you're reading through the material. And as you're reading through, you're, you get this feeling of like, I don't really know what that symbol means. And then if you stop and then you look up what that symbol means and you clarify it, or you're like, I don't really know what this word means. Let me redirect. I would be studying for a test and I would be freaking out about, oh my God, I don't know what's going to be on this test. I mean, I understand that the, the range of chapters are right in front of me. We're going to test you on chapters one through four, but I would still be freaking out. What's on the test? It's not going to be these you know 6,000 words. What's on the test? And I would freak out and fail the test. <laughs> well, the crucial thing is that you freaked out. Yes. Right? And but I think test anxiety in that manner is very familiar with people who are you know, going back to the beginning of the conversation, afraid of not succeeding, of not getting that A. Well, and this is where FDR becomes so useful because, you know, you had that great line, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. So, mm -hmm. But we don't because fear is actually beneficial, right? Well, that's, this is where we come back to the idea that fear is appropriate or inappropriate. So fear around a snake, great. And, you know, I swear they said, you know, the test is not a lion. So there's no scenario in which your math test literally kills you, right? It can't eat you. You might get a paper cut, but you're not going to die. And so the point is, is that, you know, it's, it's not, you're making your own life worse by allowing yourself to be afraid of that math test. So you have to manage that fear. You have to talk yourself down and you have to say, you're being ridiculous. This is not a thing to be afraid of. This is a series of information. I'm going to pick it apart. And I'm going to figure it out. And I think part of it is just sort of really demystifying a lot of this material. And, you know, in the Straight A Conspiracy, we use the analogy of Betty Crocker cake mix, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if anybody can make a Betty Crocker cake. Just open the box, pour right? it in, add the oil and whatever. That's right. Yeah, there's, a, there's clear directions and you follow them and you get them right. And if you get a bad cake, well, what does that mean? It means you follow up. the directions. Yep. Right? So the point is, it's the same thing. Math is a recipe. You know, there's a recipe to, you know, the rules of grammar. 
there's a recipe to all these things. And the reason why people are getting things wrong, it's not because of you, it's because of what you do. And are you clear on the recipe or are you not clear on the recipe? And it should be that, uh, that you know, emotionless or that sort of, it's not even really emotionless. It's that sort of like, it's not a big deal. It shouldn't be a right? big deal, right? But it becomes a big deal. It becomes embarrassing. It becomes well, something that lives with well, you. And if somebody says, oh, dude, you messed up that recipe, the anxiety starts building as an adult. Anyway. Well, it, it can, it can. But the point is, that's where it comes down to being a honey badger and not giving a fuck what anybody else thinks. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's like, that's the point is this, that it's, you know, it's really, it's no different than baking a cake and you're going to burn a bunch of cakes. And the point is let's, you know, let's just be looking at, okay, how can you have a better chance of success? And if you keep on upping your chances of success and upping your percentages and upping all of that, then, you know, over time, your process will get better and better and you'll be less and less freaked out about it. Well, let me ask you this. But, you had a very, you had a very, yeah, very interesting it. upbringing, I would say, right? I mean, your mom, she grew up near Fort Riley, Kansas, and your dad's a doctor. You were born in Saudi Arabia. You went to Eaton for primary school, right? And you went to Harvard for your, yeah. your, your bachelor's. Would you say you learned how to become a honey badger or did you become enabled to be a honey badger because of the, I don't want to say effortless because that maybe that's robbing you. But let's say, for example, Charlie grew up in a family whose dad barely had any education. He graduated high school fine. He didn't learn shit for four years. You know what I mean? Got out. He got a job at the fast food restaurant. They fired him. He got a job in telemarketing. They fired him too. He's barely struggling. Maybe he goes to jail for a few years. He gets out. Charlie goes to school. Charlie knows his dad doesn't have anything. His mom is, you know, working housekeeping or something. How does Charlie become a honey badger when his entire life is subsistence? Well, I think the the key thing is, is that I think there's a couple of things. One, this is a very interesting question. Um, and, you know, I think the most important thing about my childhood is just the number of different cultures that I moved between. Yeah, that's, it's really, you're a fascinating um, guy. I mean, I would love to just talk about you, but you have such well, a great, you have such a great premise that you're working with. I, you know, I can't balance the two without, <laughs> I can't decide which one I want to talk about. But, you know, your work is so important that I find myself really interested in hearing what your answer is. So I'll shut up and let you answer. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, the two are inherently related. So, you know, Carol Dweck, who, uh, you know, did a lot of the a lot of the science that our the, the straight A conspiracy is based on, you know, she says it's not research, it's me search. Right. Like everybody's always, you know, you what what you devote your life to. So much of it is this very sort of personal search based on these very personal experiences. So you know, having moved between all these different cultures, like a lot of it is just trying to figure out what the fuck is going on here. Like it was mm -hmm. confusing as shit. Like all these, you know, you, you're like, okay, I'm going to, you're, you, you know, you internalize whatever the rules are of your society. And then you're like, oh, this is how we behave. And then suddenly you move into a new cultural environment and suddenly you're like, oh, I just offended everyone somehow. Like this, <laughs> this is not a problem. Oh, fuck. Right? And you, so you, you found yourself constantly trying to fit in. So your society was like internalized. I am Hunter Mott. Yeah. I am an alien. And I am trying I to understand of, you guys. I made a tribe of, I ended up making a tribe of one because I didn't fit into any of the other tribes. And, you know, it was very, it was very, very bizarre. And so, you know, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, there's this thing that we call our shared humanity. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, this culture shit. And how does that work? And so really, you know, that's sort of been, I went through a long odyssey across the sciences to figure out, okay, what do we know as clearly as we know it? So, and you decided that biochemistry, we are all the same. We work the same way. How are we well, not the same as education or societal well, building? Or our culture. Sorry. I mean, you know, yeah. so, so yeah. A, good, a good sort of uh, practical example is that, you know, we talk about things like cultural biases. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a great example of this is that every human on the planet has optimism and pessimism, mm -hmm. right? 
So, but not every culture uh, uses optimism and pessimism as heavily. So Americans tend to be massively optimistic. Russians tend to be massively pessimistic. Is so that they, true? I mean, are we really optimistic or is that a media portrayal of us? Because man, I don't meet many optimistic people. Well, you have to talk about, so the historical experience of America. So if you read Alexis de Tocqueville, um, who was this French guy who came to America and sort of, you know, was the one to first really define what the American national character, which is, is that, you know, um, Americans are optimistic. You also have to remember, Brian, how many Russians do you know? Uh, well, I'm in New York, so <laughs> a lot more than probably the normal American. How how optimistic would you say the? I mean, New Yorkers are also a very particular thing. We're not a very optimistic society up here. <laughs> yeah, but compared to Russians, yeah, they're pretty bleak. Yeah, they're about as bleak as it gets. So this is all questions of degree, right? But certainly there is, you know, Americans in general tend to be more optimistic than Russians. Uh, you know, people yeah. from Russians or or whatever, right? So, and this has certain consequences. You know, so American foreign policy, the, um, optimism is great. It makes people more happy, more productive, but it tends to make them delusional. And so American foreign policy is a long, long series of delusional adventures um, where, you know, we're like, oh, my God, this is so great. They have pigs. We're going to take out Castro. What? Uh -huh, we lose. <sighs> yeah. You know, oh, my God, we're going to go to Iraq and they're going to thank us for bringing them. Oh, oh shit. and 10 years <laughs> later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's that. There, there's a lack of planning that often happens in American foreign policy. I, mean, I want to digress just one second, just because I had a thought a few months ago about our great military. We haven't actually yeah. won anything since World War II. You know, like uh, yeah. hardcore, we won this war. We stalemated in Korea. We lost Vietnam. We basically didn't do anything in Desert Storm. Iraq came. We didn't do anything there either, but waste 15 years. Afghanistan, the same thing. It's like, where, where are we the greatest military and what did we do? <laughs> well, and, you know, I mean, let's not forget Granada, though. We oh, landed. yeah, we landed on that, that <laughs> tiny. <laughs> we decimated them. We kicked ass. And then Panama, too. We did some really wonderful things capturing that one guy. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, but I, I and, you know, a large part of it is, uh, you know, also what are the kind of wars that we're being expected to fight and what are the wars that we're actually trying to fight, you know? Mm -hmm. um and so much of it is is that you know i mean world war ii was the sort of showcase masterpiece war for uh the u.s military but then increasingly you know it's moved more and more towards these guerrilla wars mm -hmm. and you know i mean this is john nagel's point uh in the counterinsurgency manual that you know that's not what the u.s military is really set up to do it's not it's it's no. set up to fight the wrong kind fight of those war. really big showcase wars yeah yeah exactly and nobody um, wants to fight those anymore because of the body count nobody wants to yeah. have those numbers float in the u.s the, the news yep or worry uh, about that bomb being dropped again which is a really big deterrent no no, no. <laughs> we're okay yep. we'll back up <laughs> but anyway digress back into pessimism optimism and but so you, you can see that everybody has this pessimism and optimism, but different cultures favor it more than the other. And so the Russians massively favor pessimism. And the result is, is that, uh, you know, there are 10 times as many deaths from alcoholism in Russia than there are in America. Yeah, what's their, so, their life expectancy is, what, 40 or 50 years old, something extremely low. Ridiculously low, and it keeps dropping as they get more pessimistic. But so, um, you know, there are these very, you know, it's not, that's, that's how that shared humanity is working, but how you're getting these very different outcomes based on, you know, these, the, the, you know, mindsets being favored, you know, one more than the other. Um, so it's, that's, that's really how culture works. And there's a series of these mindsets. Optimism, pessimism is the one that I use because it's the one that people are most familiar with. Atomism and holism is another one uh, people tend to be less familiar with. That's really, you know, do you look at things in terms of, uh, you know, the forest, the big whole picture, or do you look at it in terms of atomism, in terms of tree, 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 tree? Let's look at everything in terms of little pieces. And that's, you know, that shows up in terms of Asia versus the West, where, you know, Asia has this very sort of collective mindset in terms of the society. And then, you know, the West, really, it's all about individuals, lots and lots of separate individuals. So, forest, Which is odd, because Asia has a huge suicide rate. 
which is a very yeah korea japan china they kill themselves i don't know if that's because they're excluded from the group or not i didn't oh, yeah, yeah yeah so there's there's i mean firstly depression rates are actually lower in asia um because they have a bigger sense of belonging and community and but if you don't belong then they're not going to help you belong and you might as well just go ahead and do it then right but the, that's the key thing is is that when people then feel excluded from the group in some sense right when they feel you know ostracized you know then there's a shame to the community and so therefore you know that's that's you know that suicide becomes a problem but um, that, that definitely makes sense but you know i mean all of these dynamics there's lots and lots and lots going on but the, the key thing and you know really my goal with all of this is I mean, on a personal level, it's just being to sort of try and make sense of this riot of cultures that I've been traveling through my whole life. But then I really mostly just want to start to spark a conversation where, you know, rather than us sort of, you know, getting, you know, digging our heels in and being like, my culture is the best, yeah. or you know, your culture sucks, right? That we yeah. instead focus our, our energies and we have the internet, which is great. Mm -hmm. We can have conversations like this. But that we devote our energies to trying to figure out, okay, what is this culture stuff that we picked up? How does it drive our choices? And then what is really going to set us up to succeed? And the, the, the education stuff and my personal story, I mean, it's all one big tapestry because, you know, we, we Katie and I started off looking at the culture of schools, which is a great place to start because there are very there are very clear behaviors that set you up for success in learning. And there are things like embracing mistakes, looking up things you don't know, being curious, um, you know, really picking apart things that are confusing until they're clear, um, you know. But Charlie, getting back to that guy, he's not being allowed to make those kind of decisions. He's being told, well, you messed up on this word, you are an idiot. You're going to fail. You're going to prison. Oops, I'm sorry. I just tripped over something. <laughs> My well, office is completely messed up. But that's why we tell Charlie that, it, that the problem isn't Charlie. The problem is, is that his culture is nuts. So, you know, once you realize that your culture is nuts, you're like, oh, these people are crazy. Like, that's okay. They, they're nuts. They picked up a culture that made sense, you know, 100 years ago. We no longer live in that environment. And now I'm going to leave my tribe and I'm going to go join a new tribe. And, you know, the more, I mean, that's the point of doing mixed mental arts is we were just like, you can endlessly say the tribe needs to change. The tribe needs to change. But the much better way to do it is you just leave the tribe. You go, you form your own tribe with anybody who wants to join it and you start evolving a better tribe. And then now it's very easy for people where they could say, Oh, there's this insane tribe, and then there's this tribe that actually makes sense and that is doing cool, awesome stuff. What tribe do I want to join? Now I have a choice. And, you know, the more and more we evolve a better tribe, the more we'll pull people off until the, the new tribe it becomes the sort of like, that's how we operate. And it's a much more sane way of operating. But Do you get a sense, though, that you're potentially bailing out a sinking rowboat with a thimble? Because, I mean, no. I get that sense sometimes. I mean, I get that we're <laughs> just bailing out the ocean into the ocean of, you know, Charlies are just, they're multiplying. They're multiplying. And you can blame the parents. You can like, blame their culture because their culture is disintegrating yeah, into and video games is, and action movies or whatever. And so the point is, is that we say to Charlie, rather than, you know, trying to bail out your sinking rowboat, it's like that rowboat's done. Join, we're building a cruise ship. Come join our cruise ship. Charlie's unhappy right? though. Charlie's so miserable yeah. and angry. And that's what, and Charlie wants <laughs> and to hurt everybody. <laughs> and that's and that's why Charlie should Charlie shouldn't be in that tribe. His tribe sucks. Yeah, and does. And Charlie's going to end up in prison, right? And per, Charlie's going to read your book and go, "Damn it, if I had known this earlier." But it's already too late for that's Charlie right. because Charlie gets out of prison now. Charlie doesn't have anything, and he might have been it's like awakened done. in prison. But what does Charlie do at that point? It's, it's never too you late. You don't think so? And, you know, no, of course not. And, you know, and I think crucially also, you know, so there's this uh, great Japanese concept called kintsugi, right? Well, I'm familiar um, with it, but I can't remember what it means. Yeah, so the Japanese, because they have this holistic perspective, you know, there's this great sort of, uh, you know, wabi-sabi is like beauty and imperfection. 
And so when a pot breaks, they don't throw away the pieces. Mm. Instead, what they do is, is that they fill in the cracks with gold. So they reassemble the pot and they fill in the cracks with gold. And it makes, you know, a, you know, kintsukuroi or kintsugi, right? And it's this very, very beautiful thing because, you know, you have this pot, there are all these golden cracks that are being filled in. And it's that very much that's what we all have to do with our own life stories. It's very you know, beautiful. I mean, beautiful. it's very beautiful in terms of there's no refuse. It, it's basically everything could be recycled. Everything can be used yeah. again. And that's the same thing. You know, Charlie, if Charlie went to prison at, and, you know, read the straight A conspiracy when he was in prison and then realized, oh, shit, like, I wish I'd known this so many years earlier. Well, now Charlie can use those experiences to better tell a story to the world. Yeah, that's really interesting. Going back to Rick Ross, I mean, that's basically what he did. Look what I did. Right. Learn from it. This that's is right. the experience that I had. Do not duplicate it because it's really not beneficial. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and also, like, you know, why did I go down this road? It's because I didn't know the, that I, I had the potential to succeed within the system, and I didn't realize what I was capable of, and that's because I picked up these fucked up ideas from my culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know... Then now, you know, Rick what Ross's experience turns from being a liability into an asset. And that's the key thing is, is that you can always make kintsugi out of the pieces of your own story. And we all have, you know, that's, I think that's a huge, huge part of life is, is that, you know, you've got this jumble of broken pieces. And then you're like, what the fuck do I do with all this fucked up crap? And then you stop thinking of it as fucked up crap and you start thinking like, oh, these are <laughs> raw materials of some sort of jigsaw puzzle and I need to put them together and figure really out how cool. to fill the cracks with gold. It's really and, cool because um, if you think about it on a grander scale, humanity can be used in that exact same way. That guy in the Amazon, the Russian on Coney, uh, you know, Coney <laughs> Island, uh, me, you, we're all Kasugi, we're all refuge we can be glued together with gold maybe that's it's right. just, maybe it's a straight a conspiracy <laughs> maybe that's the philosophy that'll save humanity it's very interesting well i think that's i think that's and you know i mean i think you're absolutely right to pull it out to the you know the big scope of humanity because and that's really what we want to do with mixed mental arts is you know humanity now has a huge huge collective reservoir of you know culture and history and story and science and religion and all these other things from all these different times and places. And currently it's this jumbled mess of broken pieces, but the real potential and the real power is it still, is I mean, yes, jumbled, but it's not broken anymore because of the internet. If you think about well, it, it's all, it's all there. It, it's all glued together. It's all, it's all there, but I don't know that it's being glued together into a coherent whole. So that's, coherent, no, but it's there. Like yeah. it's this big you gigantic pile of shit, but <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. So we're at that stage where you know the and it's going to get assembled. Like I mean, I think that will happen. The question is on what timeline and how intentionally do we do it? What does it look like when it's done? And what does it look like when it's done? And the point is, is that yeah, we're at that stage where the you know we've the the pieces of the broken pot have all been dumped out on the table, right? They're all there on the internet. But now the real work comes in starting to assemble the pieces into something beautiful. And Charlie will be involved. Charlie will be involved. In That's the point is that, you know, we need Charlie because Charlie has had a very particular sense of a set of experiences. And Charlie is going to know better just how, you know, important it is to unfuck our culture. No, I, it sounds like psychology plays a gigantic part. In, in your theory, can we call it a theory? Is that appropriate? Well, it's see what I what 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 everything that I'm offering you is kintsugi. So I've just pieced together a bunch of different parts of the science and made my own pot. And the pot is not finished, and, and you know, but but I mean, a large part of this comes down to you know how do human work? How how do human beings work biologically? Mm -hmm. And you know what is it that w who are human beings? Who are we? I mean, that's if you want to build a you know what's interesting when you read like you know all the people who wrote back in the Enlightenment, every theory of society rests on an assumption about human nature, right? So 
you know, uh, democracy, right, rests on an idea. All men are created equal, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, communism rests on an idea that, you know, we can all just share everything, right? <laughs> and, you know, there's, uh, so there are all these different assumptions about human nature. And if you want to build a, a really great society, one of the most fundamental things you have to do is you have to really figure out how do human beings work, what are they going to do, and you have to get those assumptions right. That whole black so, box thing, we still don't know how the mind works. Well, we know some things, and it's that's enough, the point, though, is, is that, you know, this, well, it, it's not a, I mean, this is where engineering comes in, right? So engineering is just really about, you know, doing the best that you can do, right? So if you're in Mesopotamia or ancient Babylonia, right, you know, you could look at the wooden wagon wheel and say, oh, it's not enough, it's not good enough, right? Because it's not a radial tire with rubber and all this sort of stuff. But it's the best you can do at the time. And so in the same way, you know, the founding fathers did the best they could do at the time. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the internet, so they read books. They didn't have, um, you know, all of this knowledge about biology and all of this access to seeing how other cultures operate. So they didn't know those things. But they did the best they could do at the time. And that's the nature of being a parent is, is that you do the best that you could do at the time. And, you know, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to set up the future generations to do a little bit better. And so we know, we know there, I think it's, you'd be amazed at the number of things that we actually know about how the human mind works and about how we work. It's just that most of that science is never put together and packaged in a form that the general public can understand. You know, the, the other Brian um, <laughs> with a Y is fond, of, is fond of saying, you know, that all the best ideas are trapped in books. And that has been our experience over interviewing over 200 of these scientists is that we're like, man, it's amazing the things that you guys have figured out and the degree to which none of you talks to each other or knows. Man, what is it? Einstein said it best. You can read hundreds of books and over a period of years and still learn more with an hour of conversation. Well, absolutely. And I mean, you know, if we could actually get a lot of these people uh, into the room together to like actually talk things out, you'd be amazed at what we could figure out. If they don't argue. Uh, <laughs> if they don't start beating well, each other. Well, that's the thing. And that's the thing is, is that it has to be an environment of mutual respect and discussion and really trying to figure out our differences. You know, the biggest problem, uh, the crux of this whole matter is the me, right? The kernel of what makes you the you. Getting to the soul well, of what makes humans humans. Because that person in the Amazon thinks they're special, right? They don't really want to be a part of the bigger pot. They want to be the pot. Is there an... Well, it well, I think it depends. I mean, you know, so in practice, when, when contact is made with tribes, you know, what humans want is humans want success. So take, for example, you know, there's this great book, Joe Henrik's The Secret of Our Success, which is uh, about cultural evolution. And, you know, he talks about how, you know, many tribes in Papua New Guinea can only count as high as 78. So that's, they count fingers and toes, and then they count knees and elbows, and they work around the body a few times. But essentially, you know, that's as high as their counting system goes. Now, what happens when they make contact with another tribe, with, with, with the, you know, the sort of the larger hive mind? No, of, I, was, I was hoping you'd say, what happens when they make contact with the number 78? <laughs> when, <laughs> <laughs> what happens when they reach 79? They, they, they tap out. We're tap done. Out. You don't exist. Sorry, number there, 79. There is, there is, yeah. um, My, but, I'm putting know, a blind they, eye to you. <laughs> I'm going back to one. Yeah, but they don't even, that's the point. They don't even dream of 79. Um, you know what's really interesting to me is, I mean, speaking of numbers, uh, the idea of zero wasn't a concept prior to the invention, the, the Islamic invention of that idea of nothing. Yeah, and virtually <laughs> the Greeks couldn't figure zero out. Couldn't figure zero out. Um, because, because the, you know, the idea of, of uh, you know, they have, were so rooted in the idea of things that the idea of no thing was like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. That's not logical. And um, I mean, that goes back to what we were talking about before, too. And 
the idea of death being the ultimate interruption to everything that we're building as a culture and the glue, the gold in, in our sculpture of different cultures, um, you know, the building blocks of what you're trying to build. People want to get as much as they possibly can without the idea of it ending at the end of the day, the 79. They turn their blind eye to it. Oh, right? the 79. Well, and I mean, yeah, I think there's certainly there's that fear of death. But, you know, I mean, I guess that's the thing is, you know, part of I think what's beneficial about sort of understanding, you know, cultural evolution and understanding this sort of long run view of human history is that you understand that human history is just one long relay race. Um, and so, you know, uh, previous generations, they ran their leg, they handed the baton on to us. We then run our leg and then we hand on the baton to the next generation. Reluctantly and, though, reluctantly. Well, it's never like my, my, uh, I think about I think, Ulysses S. Grant. He died of throat cancer, right? In the middle of writing his memoir. He wasn't like, he didn't wake up the morning he was going to die and say, well, mm -hmm. this is the last sentence I'm going to write. His intention was to finish, you know, he wanted to write about the Civil War, but he died before getting there. Or I don't know, I didn't actually read the, the memoir, but <laughs> he died before finishing his life's work. Well, I mean, you know, that's true. I mean, the other thing about that, though, is, is that, you know, the whole reason why he was writing. Um, he was broke. He was poor. Yeah, he was poor and he was trying to pay his family's bills. He was, uh, now it's considered one of the best presidential memoirs ever written. But that, that wasn't even his intention. Yep. I mean, reluctantly, he handed that, that baton off to future generations saying, here is what you're aiming for, the best presidential memoir ever written that I didn't even mean to write to be the pre best presidential memoir, nor did I even finish it. Well, but I mean- and I think as a metaphor, that really works in terms of what we are as humans. We never finish what we start. And we never really define the term that we place in our lives in a way. But we can't, we can't finish what we start, right? So, you know, the, the whole point, um, so Isaac Newton has this, you know, great line, if I have seen further, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, that's a great line. And, and you know, Joe Henrik, you know, said, uh, you know, and part of what we talk about in the straight A conspiracy is, is that, you know, and we talked about this a little bit with Jim Watson, right? There are these genius myths. And, you know, so they've become these mythic figures, but in practice, the closer you look at anybody's biography and what they really did and all the people whose work they drew on, you find there are no giants. No, and that's right. They're standing on the shoulders of hundreds of thousands of people that came before them. That's right. And so and the, the guy who built the first fire, I mean, he's part of it. It's amazing, honestly, the pyramid of humanity. Yep. And so the point is that, you know, you and I are going to build the, this pyramid up and up and up and up as far as we can go. But the whole point is that, you know, your kids should then scramble up what we've done to see further than we've seen. If they don't see further than we've seen, then they haven't done their job and we haven't done our job. And it's that idea that there, it is a poor student who does not surpass his master. So... How does um how does Katie um I'd ask you I mean but I wonder whether or not you'd be able to answer um as honestly as possible but how do you think Katie feels about her father Does she feel oh, that she loves him. Does he does she think that he's the the best or is she taking it a step farther Well I think Do you know you what know, I'm trying to ask exactly because I mean I mean go ahead and answer and <laughs> Well I mean you know one of the things that Katie said that was sort of the most profound was, you know, she was like, you know, we were writing this book and then, you know, uh, this was sort of the first time that I think, you know, she got a real sense of what it was that we were doing and why it was so important was she sent chapters to uh, her parents just to read, to get some sort of feedback and get some sort of idea. And, you know, they, you know, her father called her up literally crying and saying that kid you're writing about kate that's me interesting that was me in school and you know i mean i think that's that's that is that it's you know there there are ideas and myths that have shaped so much of all of our lives and drive our choices without us even realizing it and you know when you finally so much of what this comes down to is that 
you know, we think that we're going through these things alone. And once you hear that that story is somebody else's story, then there is this moment of catharsis and this moment of opening up where you're like, oh, whoa, other people went through this. And then the more and more you have these conversations and because, you know, what ends up happening is a lot of it is, is that, you know, like this conversation, you know, people want to talk about their own educational experiences. Mm -hmm. or they want to talk about their own experiences of culture. And once people start opening up about those, you come to realize that literally everybody has been having these experiences and no one has been talking about it. And once everybody starts talking about it and starts opening up about it, there's just a whole lot of uh, sort of emotional release and discovery that comes out of that because we all realize that we've all been sort of suffering through these same experiences and nobody really had, you know, felt comfortable talking about it or knew how to talk about it. And it's, you know, it's, you know, Katie has this great analogy that she uses which is that this moment in hum his, human history is really humanity's first family dinner. You know, we've all been off doing our little thing in our little corners of the world. And now because of globalization and the internet, we're all being shoved together at a big family table. That's really, and, really, really, really apt. Yeah. <laughs> she's good. That's wonderful. She's good. Yeah. And you know, and it's like a lot of it, there's a lot of like, Oh my God, who are these people? What do they believe? Um, and you know, am I really related to these people? <laughs> like the classic teenager comments, right? Yeah. But, but at a certain point you just start talking to people and you just start hearing their stories. And you know, it's as we make, uh, you know, Joe Rogan said that, you know, he felt like the internet was in its infancy and the, it is, or in its adolescence. And it is, it's, you I know, call it's it the wild west. Yeah, man. It's, it's at the beginning. Yeah, It's the wild west. And, you know, at a certain, you know, our point, the, the point of sort of mixed metal arts and what Katie and I do and what that other Brian does um, is, is that, you know, we just really want to midwife in these conversations and help, you know, get humanity through this uncomfortable adolescence so that it can grow up and so that we can all open up. So that brings me up to um, the future. Tell me your, yeah. tell me your vision. Tell me what you think, I think next this, tomorrow is going to be like. <laughs> oh, I can't make any promises about tomorrow, but where do I think this is all yeah. going? I, I think that Marshall McLuhan back in the 1960s or whatever nailed it. Um, in the sense that, you know, I think that we are really headed towards a global village. Um, and Didn't Hillary Clinton say the same thing? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Hillary did, but, you know, she did. She stole it from Marshall McLuhan. Uh, and in practice to really have a global village you need some real emotional awareness and some real emotional o openness and that is not hillary clinton so <laughs> no, it's not um so you know that that hillary clinton is oh no hillary clinton said it takes it a takes a village to raise a child. child that's right yeah, yeah, yeah um but the you know the point is is that as a you know i mean hillary clinton is my relative right like Donald Trump is my relative. Like all these people are related to me. Yeah. And it's <laughs> like, you know, I'm, I, I have issues with both of those relatives. <laughs> yeah. And they all um, want to tell you what to do too. It's like, uh... yeah. <laughs> and it's like, what, what weird trip are you two on? Um, <laughs> that you wouldn't even want to be in that position, honestly. I mean, Joe Rogan says it best. You got to be crazy to want to be president to begin yeah. with. I mean, right away, that should be disqualifying. Do you want to be president? Sorry, you can't be. <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine standing in front of all the people in this country and saying, hey, you know what, me, I've got what it takes to tell you what to do. Well, uh -oh. it, also comes down to, it also comes down to so much of this comes down to, I think there's the interesting question of, you know, really what is leadership and particularly what is leadership in the 21st century? Um, because a lot of this comes down to, you know, uh, again, your view of human intelligence and, you know, what communication technology makes possible. So, you know, if you, I mean, you know, Napoleon, you know, there's a famous line that Napoleon may or may not have said uh, that, you know, he always wanted to surround himself with people who were smarter than him. And from a guy who came um, up as a corporal to be the emperor of France, I could attribute that to him because he basically, yeah. I mean, the guy had the skills to become yeah. something from nothing, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and um, die alone on an island. <laughs> well, and, yeah, die alone on an island. 
from uh, wallpaper poisoning. Um, <laughs> was that what it was? Arsenic poisoning? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, wasn't yeah, he poisoned was, though? I mean, there. Uh, wasn't he assassinated? Well, supposedly, his uh, the the wallpaper that he had on his island on uh, Saint Helena was this green wallpaper, mm -hmm. and you know the green wallpaper, the pigment was made with arsenic or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, is that it may have been that like repeated exposure to this wallpaper was what killed him. Wow. But you know, it's like any of these things. You're going to hear lots and lots of different theories on why he died and like. Yeah. You know, what makes the best story is probably not what's supported by uh, the evidence and, you know, who the heck knows. I mean, mm -hmm. um, the yeah. So, I mean, I'm I'm very uh, I anyway, I think that, you know, the the I, I really. Yeah, leadership, you know, I think the whole point is, is that, you know, individual humans, I think, are dumb. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't have much you know and I, that's that's what the data supports we're better together people. right i mean ultimately yep. we're not going to accomplish anything alone that's right and you know and when you look at organizations that are structured that way like toyota toyota has this great thing the toyota production system and the whole point of the toyota production system is that they recognize that everybody has knowledge and wisdom in their area so the guy who puts the wheels on the toyotas knows that job better than anybody he's the world expert he's done it thousands and thousands of times so it would be ridiculous for some guy who sits up in an office and sort of you know thinks about toyota's global strategy to come down and be like here's how you're going to put the wheel on the car right yeah. so what you want is you, you want to empower the wheel guy to make wheel decisions and you want to empower the global strategy guy to make global strategy decisions and so that's how you really get that wisdom of the crowds when everybody recognizes, oh, I have a role and a function within this organization and, you know, I'm going to do my job and I'm going to communicate and we're going to work together. And it's the same thing as the human body, right? You have a liver and the liver has certain jobs. The heart has different jobs. The stomach has other jobs. And you shouldn't have, you know, all these other organs being like, no, liver, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> or nor could you put the liver in the heart's job. It could never happen. Yeah, yeah exactly. So the, I think that in terms of, you know, you know, what leadership should be is that, you know, the point of a leader is to empower, uh, empower people within, within the organization, whether that organization is something like Toyota or whether it's a school or whether it's a family or whether it's an entire country to, you know, uh, to unleash the wisdom of crowds. That's your job. Your job is to help everybody throw in their two cents and then figure out how to evolve that into something better and a better and better conversation. So, um, and, you know, the internet really makes that possible. Like we have the tools to be able to do that. I just think that we have to get over arguing about gender pronouns. Semantics, basically. And, <laughs> yeah. Over gender pronouns and well, and what symbols. Is, I don't virtually. know. For me, and I don't know. I, what do they call? I am a cis male. I don't even like that term. But it's not even our argument. I mean, it's not my argument. I can't even imagine being called anything other than a he. But you know what? I decided well, or, it's not even any of my business because I consider myself, you know, a he. If you want to call yourself something else, oh God, I can't even imagine it. Honestly, it's just beyond me. It's beyond me. Yeah. Well, and the, the point is, is that, I mean, you know, what you're practicing here is, you know, one of the, the best things that I picked up from my dad's culture. So the Dutch have this idea called chedoche. And chedoche is, you know, it's tolerance in adverted commas. But it's tolerance literally in the sense of it's not necessarily that I like your choices or that I want them or that I would even want to think about them. But I'm going to turn a blind eye to them because I'm not prepared to argue about this. I don't really want to. The pain that they're going, you are going through, I do not. I don't want, ever want to experience it. And I'm sorry you're going through it. Yeah. And, uh, I wish you all the luck in the world trying to figure it out. That's right. But there are yeah. other things that I would rather focus on and deal with and fix. And you know that's the point: is that tribes argue about symbols, right? And you know it's what mm -hmm. the symbols represent. And so it's, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, it's the gender pronouns, it's the Starbucks coffee cups. It's, you know, I mean, there are so many of these arguments that are going on that are about symbols and it's like, okay, they're symbols. But the point is, is that what you're really arguing about 
is what the symbols or cultural appropriation and hair and whatever else. And it's like you're arguing about the symbol, but what does the symbol represent? What is the underlying issue here? Like, what is this really about? And why don't we talk about what this is really about and like fix that rather than endlessly being pissed about superficial things? Mm -hmm. And, you know, where can we agree to disagree and where do we actually really need to hash things out? Because what you're going to find, for example, is that, you know, I mean, a lot of these sort of in terms of intelligence, in terms of core principles and in terms of wisdom, right, you know, uh, like, you know, I, I've written about this before, but, you know, my own experience reading, you know, coming from the place of science and reading John Haidt's, uh, you know, happiness hypothesis is just realizing how much science has confirmed what religion already knew. Mm hmm do you know what the and, interesting thing though i mean the 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 term superficial rang to me uh, a little bit clearly what is considered superficial for one person is monumental for another you know what i mean well, it, it's and, the emotional charge so let's 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 think about the starbucks coffee cups right well at one point you used to have naked breasts on it and now they covered them up yeah what a small little tiny thing that's really insignificant when you think about it because it's just ink on paper yeah. and it became such a big thing they had to cover up that ink with other that shape like breast. <laughs> well, but I didn't even know about that one. I was thinking about the whole like Christmas designs thing. <laughs> War on Christmas. <laughs> War on Christmas. Merry Christmas. No, happy holidays. Who cares? <laughs> it's such a non thing, yeah. but to somebody, it is a huge issue and they'll fight you for but it. That's because, they'll make you bloody and painful that, over it. Well, but that's because of what it represents to them. And yes. the point is that that's like, the religion argument. Well, but whatever it is, right? Like, or, you know, it's like me calling you uh, he or she when you want to be called a zur, or whatever it is. Like, what is this really about? Like, that's, you know, the benefit of tutoring is that, you know, you work with children and teenagers say random crazy shit, right? And, you know, you're like, oh, you're saying all this random crazy shit. And then it's like, what is this really about? Like, what's about is your going feelings, on? isn't it? Yeah. And let's, get to the under and let's get to the underlying feelings. And it's like, oh, you don't feel heard or you don't feel understood or you don't feel like you have it takes what it to succeed. Or, oh, you know, this is really about the fact that, you know, uh, you feel ugly and you don't feel like any of the other, you know, this, this, uh, this girl, this boy that you have the hots for. Is going to want to talk. You're embarrassed to you. in front of him. Yeah, exactly. You're embarrassed in front of da, da, da. And so it's really it's those underlying feelings, and that's the point is, is that you learn not to waste your time. <laughs> Which boils on down to it boils down to being sexually, um, what is it, um, powerful. <laughs> Whether well, or not somebody or, wants to mate with you, which is the basicness of uh, being human. Well, and being accepted, belonging, community, safety. Boils down you know, to biology. Also, yeah, it boils down to like really hardcore biology. And the point is, is that rather than arguing, like that's the point, like arguing about the cups or anything like that, you know, if, if you had a teenager, right, and the teenager is like, you put that do you know how offensive it is like this cup is so offensive because it doesn't have it doesn't have Merry christmas on it it has happy holidays blah, 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 blah. and your you know 13 year old kid comes home and is screaming about this thing he would just be like okay what is this really <laughs> whatever about? you're 13 shut up <laughs> yeah but, but it's like really like what is this about what happened at school today and then you're like oh okay somebody said that you know uh, Christmas sucked as a holiday or somebody said that uh, like, you know, it is often so often it's something that's not even related. Right. Yeah, like it's, exactly. Like you're actually just haven't eaten. You're hangry. And, you know, <laughs> and now it's manifesting in this weird tirade about Christmas cups. Again, but, biology, right? It's not, it's superficial. Yep. It's superficial, but it means yep. something more. It means that you're not as fit as you possibly could be. Eat something. You'll be all right those Snickers commercials <laughs> stop being Betty White yeah well but also crucially you know that's the that's where the diagnosis comes in and that's what real intelligence is it's the ability to you know there's all these symptoms there's a symptom that you're screaming about Starbucks Christmas cup but like it's really being able to get to the core underlying issue it's interesting that's really interesting 
It's fixing it. Um, it's knowing there's a problem and finding yeah. a fix for it. Brian, I feel like you have read the Straight A Conspiracy. I'm reading it right now, my friend. I'm reading it right now. You are <laughs> you. I've been reading it for since I discovered you on the uh, the Joe Rogan Experience. I don't know what happened on that podcast between you and him because you seem yeah. like you're like the perfect guest for him. It was like a four hour conversation, wasn't it? I don't know. Yeah, well, it was it was very interesting. You know, I think the uh, the first three hours or whatever was going really really well. Yeah, me he too. Really, really liked it. And then Sam Harris came up, and then uh-huh. the conversation turned and got very emotional and very heated. Um, so, you know, uh, that's... And honestly, uh, I listened to the whole thing. You know, I, I really respected everything that you said. I signed up for your podcast, Mixed Mental Arts, immediately after listening to it. I was like, this dude knows what he's talking about. And I started listening to your podcast, followed you on Twitter, and then I found out that there was a problem. I was like, what? <laughs> So yeah. I don't know, my friend. I uh, the straight A conspiracy it is a philosophy, and I'm happy that you wrote it, and I'm happy that you were able to talk to me too. Mm-hmm. Well, Brian, I'm glad that I was able to talk to you. I mean, I I don't do podcasts with people who spell their name Brian with an I. Oh, good. Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, but seriously, dude, this is awesome. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that's what's so great is, is that, you know, how cool that we live in a time when you're on the East Coast, you're in New York, mm-hmm. right? Yep. And, you know, we can like, not only can we have this conversation, uh, but, Other people you know, we can, can contribute to this conversation, we can, br- you know, this is live, like, and we could share these ideas with the world. And, that's the point. That's, you know, what humanity's first family dinner can be. It can be this process of really talking things out in a productive way where we learn from each other. And I will never, ever use Manhattan, Kansas as an example. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. I don't know. I would assume that it's just a military economy <laughs> and that it's a, it's the, you know, it's a horrible place. <laughs> I don't know how your mom grew up, but. Hey, no, well, my, I mean, my, you know, my mom is from like Kansas city proper and she was born in St. Joe, but like, you know, my experiences of Manhattan, Kansas, I think I also have a very um, curated, very specific experience because mm-hmm. uh, my Aunt Joan, uh, her Uncle Charles um, used to have this uh, hog roast out in Manhattan, Kansas. So mm-hmm. it was like, I mean, you think about it, like I had literally the best possible experience of Manhattan, Kansas. We would drive in, we would go straight to, uh, you know, a Kansas hog roast, right? So a barbecue, what Kansas does best Mm -hmm. in the middle of this farm. And then all the neighbors would come from miles around. And then there's a large Mennonite population there. Mm -hmm. So the Mennonites would come. And the great thing about Mennonites is that they have never heard of any of the weird diets that Brian Callen does. They don't know about gluten free. They don't know about cutting down sugar. They don't know about any of these things. So they're just like, let's make everything maximally delicious. And, you know, it is amazing. Um, anyway, so, you know, I mean, it was this, it was a very charmed experience of Manhattan, Kansas. So I don't really know uh, what the rest of Manhattan, Kansas is like, but I always had a great time there. My experience with Kansas is going through it. And it's long and boring. <laughs> <laughs> and my experience is, with little, is, little towns outside of military posts are, you are going to get a ticket, and the people who live there are not going to like you, and they're going to want to fight you. <laughs> yeah, so these are two very different frames of reference. Yes. And I, I, I will tell you that, listen, uh, I, I, you know, having driven to Colorado with my cousins to go skiing, mm-hmm. Kansas is, is very long Ooh. and very yes. boring. And especially when western kansas where it's super dry um and you know it's just that's 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 rough but the what i will say is is that i think kansas city is a great city now this also by the way gets down to uh how the human brain works in the sense that i can't uh, it's impossible for me to say that objectively kansas city is a great city but emotionally i feel that kansas city is a great city because i have lots of really great memories there and lots of really great experiences um and uh but there is great barbecue there oklahoma joe's some of the best barbecue oh man the barbecue yes. love it so much i haven't had good barbecue in so long though there are some good places in manhattan surprisingly really oh yeah i can't remember the name of my wife would be able to tell you like in a second but she's uh she's shown me some experiences that would marvel even texas i would imagine what yeah. 
And I'm sorry that my brain doesn't work in the way that it pulls names out, but that was really good. <laughs> right, right there on 23rd Street too. Man, I wish I could remember Blue Barn or something like that. Okay, what's well, that? I'll look it up. If it's if it's on 23rd Street, I could probably, with a little creative yelping, I could probably figure out what it is. But if the it's there, it's up in Harlem too. If you if, oh, uh, is that uh, what's Ruthie Mays or something? No. I can't remember. There's there's a place in uh, Har there's a really good har barbecue place in Harlem, but I can't remember. What it you is. know what I'll do? I will ask her when she gets home today, and I'll tweet it to you, and I'll let you know what both of them are called. But they're really worth it. I mean, I've never had St. Louis bar. I've never had Kansas City barbecue. So I really can't compare it. And my experience with St. Louis was landing and being driven to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for basic training and then being driven through it again. <laughs> so I don't know anything about barbecue in that area, but hey, they, rumor yeah. is it's fantastic. Um, there's also, I, I remember actually went there with a friend. I think there's a place in Manhattan called Dinosaur Barbecue. Oh, that's what um, it is. Yeah, it's really, That's really, what it is. Yeah, that's very, very good. Highly recommend it. Um, um, let me ask you another question real quick. What are Always. your plans for leadership going forward? Do you want to run for office uh, someday? I think that um, I think that America is due for a essentially what I've always wanted is the spirit of 76. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you want know, things to be I burned mean, to the ground and built back up again? Yeah, that's what I want. I'm a fire starter. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've always I've always wondered who the next rebel leader was going to be. I I totally support yeah, exactly. you. I listen. I love playing with matches as a kid, and I figure why not set a whole country on fire? <laughs> awesome. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, no, I, I mean honestly, like I've always the the idea of the spirit of '76 and the idea of living in this time where you know, everybody is sort of really sort of asking very basic questions and sort of really questioning everything and really trying to figure out how to build the world better. Um, I think that's pretty fascinating. I think that's exciting. Like the Apollo program excites me. Yeah. Like those, those times when humanity is like, you know, and if you, I, I can't recommend enough, like Kennedy's uh, speech about the, the uh, Apollo program at Quoted Rice all the time. University is amazing it's amazing because he literally says you know most of the alloys that we're going to need to do this we haven't invented yet like we literally have no idea how to do this but we're going to do it and we're going to do it by the end of the decade and why are we going to do it not because it's easy but because it's hard and yeah. that excites me and that's yeah. what i want is to help unleash the spirit of 76 and to you know the spirit of the apollo program and like to really move ideas between cultures and to real conversations and to evolve a better culture than the world has ever seen. And cause you know, I'm, I think, you know, like who wants to sit around and be sort of pissed off at, um, pissed off at the way things are being done. Like that's over, like, let's fix it. Let's solve problems. And, you know, it's just going to be a series of doing incrementally anything we can to improve. And, you know what comes out of that? I don't know, um, but my I don't think it really matters who sits in the chair. Um, but I do think it really matters uh, what mandate that person has from the people and how well informed the people are. Um, what do you? Because that's going to. What do you think Donald Trump's mandate is? Uh, I think that. Because um, they call so him a phoenix, a, don't they? I mean, he's talking about burning things down. They, they aren't, isn't he considered a phoenix? I think that's the, the, I think, listen, you know, Donald Trump identified a very real problem, right? Like, he understood. Politicians suck. <laughs> politicians suck, you know, it is a swamp, all of that. Um, but I, there's a difference between having identified the problem and knowing the solution. Which I don't think he has a solution, yeah. I don't think he has a solution. And, you know, and partly is that, you know, to some degree he's misidentified the problem. So he talks about these jobs going to China. That's not the big problem. The big problem is automation. Um, and I don't think he's misidentified the problem. I think he's identified a way to explain what the problem is to the wrong people. Does that make sense? Go ahead, I just think, expand I mean, he has... Um, <laughs> He mastered a way to rig the election in the middle of the country with these people that have basically not been given the proper tools to know exactly how the system works. 
in a way. Well, and, and how, to, how to succeed in this economy. Yeah, well, yeah exactly. Right. They don't know that the economy has been pulled away from them, and now it's not coming back. And they thought that it yeah. was. They were told that it was. Yeah. Well, and he told yeah. them that it was. I mean, you know. They didn't know that they were getting them. lied to. They thought the, the battery plant was going to be built back up for them. That's right. Um, and so <clears throat> I think, you know, and there are sort of the, the general – rebellion against experts and you know i'm in an unusual position because you know most people who sort of rebel against experts aren't familiar with the science and so you know thaddeus russell talked about this a little bit on joe rogan um which was that um you know uh rogan um you know uh, the the you know that the the problem that most people have with academics is not the actual problem with academics, right? Um, so it's the same thing in the sense that there are really good reasons to be pissed at experts, but they're not the reasons that the general public has. Does that make sense? Uh, well, in terms of, well, not really, because if you're going to be pissed at an expert, you're going to be pissed at an attempt to aggregate information, right? And I have to appreciate the attempt to collect data and to articulate it, right? I mean, if you're going to be mad at that, then it makes no sense to me at all. Well, but the, so the, the problem is that, so for example, take all of this stuff in the straight A conspiracy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about Charles, right? And how it would be good if Charles had known this a long time ago. Well, firstly, you know, a lot of this research that we've brought together for the straight A conspiracy is 40 years old. It's been sitting around in dusty academic journals for 40 years. So there's no reason why Charles couldn't have known it a long time ago. But in practice, academics and science, they sort of solve and study problems, and then they become very territorial about their piece, so they don't assemble it and put it together and then communicate it to the public in a form that the public can appreciate and understand. Yeah, exactly. The, the straight A conspiracy is an aggregate of information that is articulated in a way that makes the data make sense. That's right. And the point is, is that, you know, what Charles should be mad at is he should be mad that none of these experts ever told him any of these things. Um, well, you make people mad, though, don't you? Well, I don't think that people being mad is, is bad. No, I don't either. I, don't I mean, let them be mad because if they're mad, that means they're, I mean, it's like a muscle being yeah. worked. Something is happening. Yep. <laughs> well, you're, I now have your attention and now exactly. I, I can figure out what are you mad about? And like, let's unpack that, those feelings. And then let's figure out what you really care about and what your priorities are. And That's my favorite Hunter Mott's phrase right there. Unpack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of feelings and they all just need to be scored <laughs> through. And, you know, it's, I don't think that's part of what you learn in working with teenagers is that having people pissed off at you is a great teaching opportunity. Well, the problem um, with Charlie though, like, is Charlie's mad that he wasn't given the opportunity to succeed. He sees it that way anyway. Maybe the opportunity already, you know, was with him. And he missed it, but he's graduated high school. He's gone to jail. He's gotten out. He wasn't able to get a job. He's gone back a few times or whatever. And all this aggregated information is available to him, but he's not finding it because maybe Charlie can't read very well. Well, so and he's mad at you for pointing it out. It's all you and you, buddy. You can read this. You can learn. It's all on you. Charlie's mad at you now. Well, and that's great. And, you know, so the question is, how do we then channel that anger? I mean, that was the, you know, the key difference between, you know, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, right, is that, you know, was Martin Luther King angry? Yeah, he was angry, right? And, but, you know, he didn't, Martin Luther King didn't think that anger was problematic if you then channeled that anger into constructive social action. And I heard that, more, I don't know, was it your podcast or Joe Rogan's that Martin Luther King was actually mad at his own culture too, the own, his own African-American culture. Yeah, that was Thaddeus Russell. Was oh, was it? So I did listen to that podcast. Yeah. So in terms of Thaddeus Russell being um you know academics and i didn't mean to interrupt you because i'm kind of confused what what were you what was your point <laughs> oh just that you know that the, the point is that someone like joe is mad at academics for you know all this gender pronoun stuff which seems oh. like silly nonsense but the <clears throat> the the bigger issue that thaddeus identifies is 
the degree to which academics don't call each other out on their own bullshit. Um, because they exist within a culture and they exist within a system and they, you know, just don't want to make waves or they don't want to create any problems. And it's very much the same thing. And, you know, you reference that there was this problem and listen, you know, the point of science is to kill bad ideas. That's what science does. It takes an idea. Okay, great. You have a hypothesis. We test it against the evidence. We see how well it fits the evidence. And then if it doesn't fit the evidence well, we chuck that idea. Like that idea failed. That hypothesis failed. The problem is, is that, you know, science is, uh, science isn't very good at doing that internally. So what ends up happening is, is that, you know, in practice, you know, so Max Planck has this famous quote uh, that science proceeds one funeral at a time. Um, it's not that truth triumphs, it's that the opponents to the new ideas just die out. And at some point, you know, it's like, okay, that all those old guys have died off, now we can move on with this new idea. So Unfortunately, it seems like in today's world, though, money speaks. And it seems like you don't want to lose your funding by saying something that's going to make the money disappear. That crosses... Right. What other people are getting paid for, and I can't. Um, can you think of an example? Well, I mean, you know, there's there's the kind of research that gets funded, and there's also there's the incentives of, you know, climate change is an example that would that would come to mind. Well, I mean, you know, and and I mean, just even in terms of the straight A conspiracy, you know, think about education what reform did. exactly. Yeah, you don't, what you don't want is if, imagine if the public knew all the ideas that academics had. Well, then why do you need the academics? And why does the problem need to be studied further? It doesn't. Well. They, they would be putting themselves out of a job. And you'd find, you'd have to find new problems to study, but there are incentives to uh, what academics are incentivized to do that aren't necessarily what are the incentives of the general public. And so the point, the, the thing that, that got me in trouble um, is, is that I called out Sam Harris because Sam Harris has long you know, said that religious people should update their minds in light of evidence. And Sam Harris has not done that himself. Many of his ideas are an extremely poor fit for uh, the biology and what we know about human beings. And there's new science that has come along from people like John Haidt, who has also taken issue with Sam Harris, and Joe Henrik, um, and David Sloan Wilson. And Sam Harris isn't responsive to it. And so Sam Harris is an absolute atheist, right? Yeah. So he's, you know, the part of no the soul. Of we're all biology. We're all chemistry. Well, you know, in practice, he just endlessly takes problem. You know, uh, takes umbrage or takes issue with what people believe and people's beliefs that don't fit data but the most basic data is, is that humans believe like we have beliefs and we are creatures of belief and we are creatures of culture and we have always had myths that enable us to make sense of the world mm -hmm. and guess what science makes myths so uh, what a hypothesis is it's a story that you tell about the world and then the question is, how well does your story fit the world? How well does it fit the data? So I could tell a story that, you know, diseases are caused by bad smells, or I could tell a story that diseases are caused by little tiny creatures called bacteria. Or Which the soul story... exists in the pineal gland or something along those lines. Or, yeah, I could tell an endless number of stories, but how well do those stories actually fit the data? Mm -hmm. So Sam Harris is a storyteller. He's a myth maker. Mm -hmm. And for example, the myths that he makes about Muslims are not very good myths. They don't, I mean, Can I was give born an example. Well, so I lived in Saudi Arabia and I recently just interviewed this guy named Mohammed Khilan, who is a Saudi guy. He was born in Saudi, grew up in Canada, um, you know, has a PhD in neuroscience and is now getting an MD. Um, and, you know, he, he's like, uh, the whole religion thing, like this weird focus on the problems of the Middle East being religion is fucking annoying because when you actually spend time in the Middle East and, you know, I've spent, I haven't, I'm not like a Middle East expert, but you don't have to spend that much time in the Middle East to understand this. The big problems are things like corruption. 
So, you know, if you look at, you know, what does it take to get anything done in somewhere like Saudi? Well, it's all about who you know, what are the relationships? You know, if, the, if, you, if you have any understanding of your Neapolitan heritage, right? You know, that's a lot of how Southern Italy works. And, you know, what ends up happening is, is that when societies don't work well and when there aren't good paths and for uh, paths for inclusivity for people like Charlie, well, what what does the Arab Charlie do? Right. He joins he an insurgency. <laughs> he joins an insurgency. So if you really want to fix this stuff, is it that you have to stop making, you know, uh, having people be Islamic or you need to reform Islam? No, not particularly. You know, science was probably invented by the Muslims, right? Ibn Haytham was the guy who, you know, founded a lot of what we would now call the scientific method. He was the first one to have these thoughts of reproducibility and, you know, changing beliefs in light of evidence. So prior to 1970s, what, what, Afghanistan used to be a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful country. <laughs> yeah. uh, people used to go there and, so, and backpack through it. It was very peaceful and yeah. wonderful. And so if you really want to, you know, uh, deal with, you know, terrorism and, you know, Islamic fundamentalism, then what you have to do is, is that you need to be focusing people on corruption. You need to be focusing people on, okay, how do you build cultural change? By the way, when you actually talk to real experts on this, like Francis Fukuyama, they define, Fukuyama defines the problem as how do we get to Denmark? How do you evolve a society to the stage where it's, you know, as peaceful and cooperative as Denmark? And he's like, honestly, I don't know. Like, that's what the world's expert on this says. He's like, I don't fully know. And he sort of has this project to try and figure out what that is. What's a playbook for, for doing that? For duplicating and, what's happening in Denmark, the happiest place on the planet. Yeah, exactly. But the point do you is- know do you anyway, know statistically, like, corruption in Denmark, is it high or low? Probably uh, low, right? It would be really low. Really low. But in, this, in the Middle East, it's Iraq, really high. Really high. So if you get rid of corruption, you're yeah. going to stop a lot of the bullshit that's happening, and Islam goes back to a religion of peace. Yeah, it becomes a much more docile thing. And, you know, also you have to then break down this idea that the new atheists have driven that somehow religion and science are odds. So you have to understand that Sam Harris is a whole brand that he's built um, and, you know, he's sold Joe on that mythology and lots and lots of people have called out Sam Harris, like, you know, Hannibal Buress took issue with him. John Haidt took issue with him. Abby Martin took issue with him. Ben Affleck took issue with him. Glenn Greenwald, Ray Zuslan. The number of people who have taken issue with Sam Harris is like, you know, I'm just the last in a long litany. But at every stage, Joe has defended Sam. And at what point does Joe wonder, is the issue uh, all these other people or is the issue Sam Harris? And do Joe's feelings about Sam Harris affect his, his thinking on Sam Harris? Because there's essentially, like I think that's what's exciting for this community is because you can bring two things into conflict. There's Joe's principle that Joe Rogan questions everything. Mm -hmm. And then there are his feelings for Sam Harris. And you can both like Sam Harris and he can be your buddy that you go and do Brazilian jiu-jitsu with and you enjoy hanging out with. And separately, you can realize that his ideas don't fit the evidence very well. And if you want better ideas, then great. Let's go get better ideas and let's test them. And I may be you know, in exile from the, the court of Joe, and that's fine. But, you know, there, in the meantime, you can, there are lots of scientists that you can be interviewing, like John Haidt, like Francis Fukuyama, like David Sloan Wilson, like Joe Henrik. And I think that, you know, everything should be decided. I mean, if you're these, you know, Sam and Joe both really articulate this principle that we should change our minds in light of evidence. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have to go and look at that evidence before you can decide what beliefs best fit the evidence. Totally, you have to question it. Is uh, Brian Callen also yeah. on the on the outs too? I haven't seen him on the podcast in a while either. Oh, I think you know. I think in practice, it's just that I am in particular. Uh, I think Brian, Brian and Joe are fine, you know, and that's that's great. And uh, I think that it's just that you know, I uh, it was you know, I mean, listen, it's not uh, the the conversation went well. I was at the time experimenting. <laughs> well, I, I gotta say, man, it was great, and that's where I discovered you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm anyway, sorry that it, I it, was, it was, I, I, it is, it is what it is. I mean, you know, that's the point. Like 
I, uh, I'm not, I'm not trying to, like, I was, you know, even if you listen to that episode, like, I wasn't, I'm not trying to be liked here. I, I'm trying to start a conversation and I'm trying to move ideas. And, uh, you know, I don't, like, I really do believe in Hanlon's Razor. I don't think there are bad people. I do think there are oblivious people. And you can't become woke as fuck unless you've actually looked at the evidence. Like, you have to have looked at both sides of the evidence and understand that there's an alternative to the Four Horsemen. Um, and the alternative is what we're calling the Holy Trinity of Cultural Evolution, which is John Haidt, Joe Henrik, and David Sloan Wilson. And so yeah. I, I, think, I think this community should decide, and this community should look at both sides and see which sets of beliefs uh, best fit reality, because that's what science is about. Science is about giving the best description of reality to serve the people and empower them to make better practical choices. I would argue one point, obliviousness, I don't know as much mm -hmm. as I think people are in a lot of pain. Well, there's and that people too. are painful. Yeah, often, often yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. That's a great, you know, because it's often not that people are being oblivious, but they're, they're actively avoiding something. So I got to say, thank you so much. I was nervous coming into this thing, but you're a great conversationalist. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for doing this thing. Uh, Mixed Mental Arts is your podcast. Totally recommend checking it out. Um, you want to mention anything before we uh, say goodbye? Uh, the Straight Conspiracy is also available in Spanish as La Conspiración de las Calificaciones. <laughs> um, it'll be in the show notes, I'm sure. Yep. But uh, anyway, we, uh, we're really just excited to move these ideas because the point is, is that the Charlies of the world, whether their names are Charlie or Abdullah, um, you know, shouldn't have to go down a shitty path. No. They should know their own potential and they should be empowered to uh, take charge of their own life. 100%. I hope we can talk again. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. Yep. Thank you so much. It was great. Thanks, Thanks so much, Brian. Bye-bye. And that was Hunter Mott's uh, Straight A Conspiracy. Again, it's his book. Check out the show notes. I'm 100% po uh, positive I put all his contact information in there. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at B-R-Y-A-I-E-L-L-O. Uh, BrianEyellow.com is up and running, trying to put, get as much fiction on there as possible. Um, you know, check out uh, Fantasy Writing on Reddit. Highly recommend it. You can also get fiction up on there. Science Fiction Writers, also a great place to go. Prompt of the Day, great subreddit also. Um, that's pretty much it for right now. Uh, I do have number 10 is Caroline Lure. She is from New Zealand. Librarian, publisher, really great author as well. Um, she'll be down the line. Um, until then, thanks for joining me and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.